Stanley Knowles was elected to Parliament in 1942 after the death of J.S. Woodsworth in a by-election in Winnipeg North Centre. <coughs> Stanley had run before in 1935 and in 1940. He came to Parliament in 1942. And the new CCF MP for Winnipeg North Centre would go on to sit in Parliament in one way or another for 51 of the next 55 years. 38 as a member of parliament and 13 as an honorary officer of the House of Commons. For four years between 1958 and 1962 after being defeated in the Diepenbaker sweep, Stanley worked at the Canadian Labour Congress laying the foundations for the new Democratic Party of Canada. Stanley's criticism of that parliament, a parliament at that time in 1960, is instructive. In 1960, he said the problem with the Parliament was that it was unbalanced, that there was no strong alternative being offered to the worldview jointly held by the other party. Now, Parliament today is similarly unbalanced, but it's not as unba unbalanced as it was <laughs> before the most recent election. And we know how pleased Stanley would have been to have seen some balance return to Parliament. And particularly how pleased he would have been to have been able to greet the new MPs who returned the area he formerly represented to the NDP fold. And we know how pleased he would have been to have welcomed all the new NDP MPs from the land of his heritage, Nova Scotia. Now early in his parliamentary life, Stanley decided to master the rules of Parliament. A good idea for any member of Parliament, but most of us don't manage and made his reputation during the Great Pipeline Debate of 1956, a debate in which his theological training showed forth. In that epic battle against closure, now an everyday occurrence in the House of Commons, under the euphemism of time allocation, Stanley asked, what will it profit a nation if it gains a pipeline and loses its part? Indeed, I had the great good fortune to see Stanley in action in a lesser pipeline debate in the summer of 1981, I believe it was, months before his stroke, when the NDP caucus was opposing the pre-build of the southern portion of the Alaska gas pipeline. At a critical moment when we needed a delay in order to counteract the latest government procedural tactic, Stanley rose on a point of order. He cited precedents rulings of former speakers going back to the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. All from memory, although there was no one who could have disputed with him about it anyway. <laughs> going on for as long as was needed in order to bridge this tactical gap that had to be bridged. I forget what it was. And I had listened carefully and when he Stanley sat down, I said, Stanley, I listened very carefully, and uh, I'm not sure whether you act actually have a point of order. And he said, uh, I might not, he said, <laughs> but I'm the only one who knows why I might not. <laughs> Stanley was revered for his knowledge of Parliament, even by those who were knowledgeable themselves. Speakers looked to him for guidance. One of the things I noticed when I first got to Parliament was the speaker and even the clerks at the table kind of looking down at Stanley to see if they were doing the right thing. And I'm told during a long debate in 1969 over changes to the rules, which were imposed by closure, I might add, no less than a combination of parliamentary names than Tommy Douglas, David Lewis, John Diefenbaker, Jed Baldwin, Ray Alcoet, and Bob Stanfield found themselves clustered around Stanley's desk, asking for advice on what to do next. Now, as one of the many rookie NDP MPs who were elected in 1979, I was privileged to experience a few years in Parliament with Stanley as our House Leader. He was a good teacher and a fine example of what it meant to be a member of Parliament, and he conveyed to me and to others that love of Parliament which can make one a great defender of the institution, but also, importantly, at the same time, 
someone who wants to reform it in the search for an ever more effective democracy, which sometimes means recovering those more democratic elements of its tradition which have been eroded by the accumulated arrogances of successive governments seeking to minimize power of